This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 982, recorded on February 9th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York... Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. So tell me, Daniel, what's more frequent at the moment, influenza, RS, or COVID? Uh, you know, none of the above. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> okay. Actually, um, you know, and it, it is important, I always say, to like not just, you know, what am I seeing in my own backyard, but what's going on around the country? Because, you know, here in New York, um, you know, we are really doing great when it comes to all of these. Actually, as a, as a country, you know, the, the flu, it peaked, it came down. RSV peaked, came down. Uh, COVID locally peaked and came down. Um, but, you know, it's, it's sort of moving across the country. So uh, we kind of got the COVID uh, peak a little bit earlier. So still, still mm -hmm. hearing uh, problems across the country. But boy, right. flu and RSV are, are really down everywhere. That's good. Yeah, it, it is. It is. All right. Let's get right into it with the quotation. The greatest friend of truth is time. Her greatest enemy is prejudice and her constant companion is humility. Um, and this is by Charles Caleb Colton. Um, I don't know Charles Caleb Colton very well, but I just love this uh, quotation about how, you know, it, it takes time to get the truth. And the more time goes by, uh, the more things become uh, clarified there. So um, right up front, I want to share the article, uh, Consistency of COVID-19 Trial Preprints with Published Reports and Impact for Decision-Making uh, Retrospective Review published in BMJ Medicine. Uh, our listeners are aware that during the pandemic, we often would discuss preprints and um, even discuss how reviewing preprints um, should perhaps be part of graduate and medical education. Uh, well, here in this, uh, in this paper, after reviewing um, 365 trials, 101 available as preprints, uh, the authors reported that they found no compelling evidence to indicate that preprints uh, provided results that are inconsistent in general with published papers. They sort of suggest about a 3% um, of the time um, them sort of misleading. Um, they also pointed out, I think this is important, that preprints remain the only source of findings of many trials for several months. Um, I'm going to agree with the comment, an unsuitable length of time in a health emergency that is not conducive to treating patients with timely evidence. Um, so a few of my comments, my editorial, I, I do worry about preprints. And actually, I had never posted a preprint prior to 2020. Um, I've actually always found that despite the, uh, the delays, my publications are usually improved by the peer um, review process. But, but yes, the, the actual data doesn't change. So um, in a time of emergency, it does seem to make sense to have a faster process. And here I'll just sort of complain. You know, I currently have two papers out for review and it's been months. <laughs> um, you know, the side uh, we often do not discuss is the challenge actually of getting reviewers to respond promptly and uh, reasonably so that this process does not take as many months, as many revisions. Um, and there's a problem here. This is currently an unpaid process for reviewers and just considered part of our academic duty. Yeah, that's the problem, Daniel, because People do it when they can, and it can take many weeks. So that's that's a problem, and I don't know how to get around it. Yeah, I, I think if it was something where it was you you were given this, and hey, you know, we're gonna, you know, it wouldn't have to be a lot. Like it's twenty dollars an hour if you you know get this in, you know, by tonight. Here's a hundred dollars. Um, you know, that, that is, <laughs> a, I don't know, this is my paradigm for the future, but it just seems that this whole concept of an unpaid process for just a growing number of papers, uh, particularly during the, you know, public health emergency, um, you know, it was a lot of money being thrown around. Uh, maybe some of it could have been focused on timely reviews. I remember even the recovery trial, right? I mean, great data there. How many months between the posting of the preprint before we finally saw something? And we'll talk a bit a little bit later about a, a paper that just came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, and that data was out for a while. So, 
Most journals are not wanting for money, and so they could do that. I just think if someone's busy, it's not going to make a difference if they get paid or not. But what do I know? Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. So, all right. RSV Influenza, as as we mentioned, things, things are better um, for the moment with RSV and flu. Uh, but there was an interesting article that addresses the concept of imprinting with flu vaccines the negative effect of pre-existing immunity on influenza vaccine responses transcends the impact of vaccine formulation type and vaccination history, published in JID. Um, I had some issues with the article, um, such as when in the first sentence they say, sterilizing immunity to influenza virus primarily <laughs> relies on neutralizing hemagglutinin and HA, specific antibodies that block infection of host cells. Um, you know, the most common strategy to induce this protection for humans is intramuscular vaccination, typically involving inactivated influenza vaccines derived from viruses anticipated to match circulating strains. Um, it's a somewhat complex paper, but the data does seem to support that prior vaccination is associated with a less robust response to the next vaccination in terms of T cells and antibodies. Um, now, I'm going to talk about another paper when we get to COVID vaccines. I want, to keep, I want people to keep in mind this finding um, as I discuss the importance of prior vaccination enhancing response to infection, which might, I'm going to say, be more important than response to your next vaccine. All right. The article, Highly Pathogenic Avian Influenza A, H5N1 Virus Infection in Farmed Minx, Spain, October 2022. I guess this falls under influenza, a different type of influenza. This was published as a rapid communication in Eurosurveillance. Uh, lots of concern uh, regarding avian flu, and it's being found in mammals um, and a number of mammals that have died recently. In this report, we hear that during the first week of October 2022, an acute increase in the mortality rate was identified at an American mink farm in Galicia, Spain. Um, the farm clinical veterinarian collected oral pharyngeal swabs from uh, initially from two affected animals. The samples analyzed at the uh, Central Veterinary uh, Laboratory um, actually uh, tested negative uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2, but positive for H5N1. Uh, Post-mortem examination revealed hemorrhagic pneumonia and red hepatization of the lungs as the most notable lesions. Um, the mortality rate increased on a weekly basis until reaching a peak um, about the mid-end of October. Um, on the 18th and 26th of October, additional sampling was implemented across distinct areas of the farm. Uh, they say prioritizing the barns presenting the highest daily mortality um, and the presence of H5N1 virus was confirmed with, I, I, I fixed this a little, high <laughs> RNA copy number <laughs> based upon quantification cycle or CQ values in oral pharyngeal, rectal swabs, and lung samples. Um, they went ahead um, uh, with culling activity, as they say. Uh, about 52,000 uh, mink were, were culled. Um, the mink farm had a staff of 12 workers, 11 of whom had um, been in contact with the animals and were also involved in the culling activities. Um, and uh, they, they did not, um, basically all those swabs were negative for the avian influenza virus. Um, dare I say now it gets interesting? Um, they, I think it gets interesting, they identified an amino acid change, I corrected this too, uh, T271A, so a threonine to alanine at position 271 um, in the PB2 gene. Um, same change um, they report being present in the avian-like PB2 gene of the 2009 pandemic swine origin influenza. Um, the concern here is that this may be associated with human tropism. So um, as I go forward, because Vince, I'm going to ask you to jump in on this, by the way. Um, so, you know, is H5N1, the next pandemic, already giving us notice? Um, not sure how many of our listeners subscribe to uh, Sid Rap out of the University of Minnesota. Um, you can actually go there, click, put in your email and subscribe. I'm and going to encourage you to do that. But February 7th, we had the announcement, Peru confirms H5N1 avian flu in marine mammals, part of southward spread. So we hear that in Peru, they found at least 585 sea lions and 55,000 wild birds 
um, dead in several of the country's coastal nature preserves. Um, they say likely due to avian flu, and they've confirmed um, avian flu, H5N1 in sea lions, in a dolphin, and then they actually had a lion in a zoo in central Peru um, with H5N1 identified as likely cause of death. Um, to expand this, the United States uh, so far has reported 110 detections in mammalian species, bears, foxes, skunks, possums, raccoons, seals, and a recent report of three grizzly bears in Montana. Um, the H5N1 clade circulating in birds, poultry, and an increasing number of mammals um, has um, that, uh, that amino acid change of which we spoke. Um, several, um, seven human H5N1 infections have been reported, all involving people who had close contact with poultry. Some illnesses were mild, um, but some were, were severe or fatal. Um, so far, we're not seeing any human-to-human -human transmission, um, but we did from that mink report suggested basically mink-to-mink, mammal-to-mammal transmission. So uh, comments, thoughts, Vince, and sort of hitting the media hard place lately. Well, getting into mammals is a big deal, uh, especially transmitting among the mink, that's that's concerning. It's also pathogenic. Now we should point out that this virus has been circulating for for over fifty years, and has not entered humans in a transmissible way. There have been uh, four or five hundred human deaths, I think, out of eight hundred human documented human infections. So it hasn't acquired transmissibility. Now the past year we've seen a lot of activity in birds. So m more replication that we've seen before. And as you know, when a virus replicates, it sustains mutations. And so there's always the chance that the right combination could arise to make it transmissible. So who knows? No one can predict. Uh, but the good news is we do have an H5N1 vaccine that could be used in the case of uh, some human spread. Yeah, so that that's encouraging, and I think, um, you know, the one side which I think is sort of a uh, our listeners uh, call to arms, right? There's there, there's a couple uh, troubling folks who are who are sort of uh, very worried about us doing research on pathogens such as this, and I actually have to say I think it's really important that we uh, that we pay attention and do um, research on pathogens such as this to understand what what is it that allows it to uh, to get into mammals, what allows it to transmit between mammals. Um, yeah, head in the sand is not a good approach at this moment. All right, measles, just some closure on the measles outbreak in central Ohio after a total of 85 cases with 36 children requiring hospitalization for this vaccine-preventable illness. Um, this has been declared over. Um, there are a few pending tests, but per the CDC, this is officially over with no new cases reported for 42 days, so two incubation periods of the measles virus. Um, by the way, none of these children were fully vaccinated. All right, COVID. A uh, couple things right up front. Um, I say two, but actually it's three. Um, one, how good are we at predicting the future? Uh, people <laughs> may have caught the most recent update of the CDC um, page, COVID-19 forecasts, hospitalization. Uh, let me just read. This week's national ensemble predicts that the number of new daily confirmed uh, COVID-19 hospital admissions will remain stable or have an uncertain trend with 700 to 6,900 new confirmed COVID-19 hospital admissions likely reported on February 24th, 2023. So I love that. Um, you know, it could be stable or it could just do whatever it could do. It's really not much of a prediction, right? I feel like I'm Yogi Berra here. Hey, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. Um, with this wide range, I'm going to be a bit more optimistic. Um, you know, I anticipate we will see, based on prior years and prior experience with respiratory pathogens, um, that things actually are going to start to improve, um, and our daily deaths um, probably dropping from this plateau um, that's being reported of 500 per day. Um, you know, there's always this pattern of hospitalizations than deaths. So, you know, as hospitalizations have started to drop, I'm thinking that deaths will will start to drop going into the future. So, um, you know, you've, you've got me quoted here, so you'll be able to go back and tell me whether or not I was right. Um, to the variants, um, I thought this was interesting. I got some, uh, I don't know, emotional 
emotional correspondence as of late. Um, and it's this question is um, the variant, should they have nicknames such as ones like the Kraken, Hydra, et cetera? Um, where, where does all this come from? Um, so <laughs> I thought our <laughs> listeners might find it interesting to get the perspective on this from T. Ryan Gregory, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Uh, for starters, don't send him or me hate mail, please. But um, he and a few others uh, feel that the current terminology is too technical and impenetrable for many. Um, he's part of a chat group of genomic researchers. And after the first subvariant monster nickname Centaurus, father of the half man, half horse race of centaurs, talk off, took off on social media, they started proposing similar nicknames whenever they seemed, as they say, useful with no formal process. Um, Centaurus is, is also a constellation, um, but monsters became the style, some from Greek myths, some from Norse. Uh, Dr. Gregory says that they are not chosen to be scary especially <laughs> or to cause alarm, but rather to be distinct. Uh, beyond that, it's pretty arbitrary. Um, others include the famous human-headed winged lion, the Sphinx, that's BA.5.1, the bull-headed human-bodied minotaur, BF.7, uh, Cerebrus, that's BQ.1.1, uh, the three-headed dog that guards the uh, gates of hell. Um, you know, I have to say, I understand the concept that these are just supposed to be, uh, you know, better way for you to remember, uh, but naming variants after monsters does suggest to me some degree of menace. <laughs> Vincent, what? I see you shaking your head. What? I don't understand how alpha and delta and gamma and omicron are impenetrable. I, I don't understand <laughs> that. I understand the subvariants might be, but since when do they have to be household words, right? Most people don't know how to deal with all these variants. So I, I just don't think you need to do this. And I agree with you, <laughs> monsters. And who's going to remember which monster is which one? It's, it's just, this is a problem that doesn't need solving. <laughs> <laughs> In my opinion. Okay. All right. Well, so just so people understand the, the background there. Um, three, excess mortality. Are we doing as well with COVID as we think? Um, you know, I know there's growing discussions around this topic. Um, so I'm going to leave a link into the COVID data tracker weekly review by the CDC um, that links to CDC data, including cases, hospitalization, deaths, wastewater monitoring, other information. Um, the very interesting thing is that excess De deaths, um, you know, do track very closely with rises in COVID deaths, um, even when we are not in surge conditions. Every time the COVID deaths go up, the excess deaths go up. One of the things that if you go and look at this, you'll notice is early on when excess deaths went up, COVID deaths, they tracked pretty well. So we're now seeing about twice the excess deaths that we would expect this time of year, but only half of them are attributed to COVID. So what are those other 50% of these excess deaths? So um, this is going to be a challenge going forward. How, how reliable is any of our data about COVID cases, COVID deaths? So, Well, Daniel, there could be COVID-related deaths, but you know, it doesn't end up on the death certificate. It could be, you know, psychological issues, suicide, uh, people not paying attention and getting in car accidents, all that sort of thing, all caused by the pandemic stress, but not something you would say is COVID caused, right? Yeah, and I think that's I think that's important. I mean, not everyone who dies dies of COVID, even if COVID is circulating, and not everyone necessarily dies acutely of COVID. Um, you know, in in some cases that I think we're aware of with other situations, a recent article about people that end up in the hospital with you know bacteremic um, pneumococcal pneumonia, uh, a chunk of those people will have a, a myocardial infarction in the hospital, and and yeah, there's sort of a relationship there. So children, COVID, and other vulnerable populations. Um, I, I just sort of going to nod my head to this. I, I know it's pretty difficult, this whole idea that, hey, you know, you know, 90 percent of the people that, that have died of COVID are over 65. They're going to be dying pretty soon anyway. Yeah, if you're over 65, if you care about people who are over 65, then, yeah, that's not so reassuring. So it moves us right into the have a plan. Um, remember masks, remember ventilation, and, and other ways of keeping yourself safe. Yeah, and you're saying I'm going to die soon? I'm over 65. Yeah, you know, Vincent, if you die, you know. <laughs> 
I'm not ready to write you off. That's that's what I just want to say to you, everyone else over 65, everyone out there with a, with a health problem. Um, yeah, we're all going to die. What you know the, the what is the greatest risk factor for death? It's being born. Yeah, but we, we're all going to well, die. It's just a question of when and how. And let's try to make so. that when and how something farther off in the distance. We need we need to make a plan for microbe TV. Okay, so that <laughs> you know keeps going. <laughs> All right. Yeah, particularly, yeah, particularly as we have this conversation. <laughs> so. All right. And what is that? One of the best ways, COVID active vaccination. So um, uh, first, I'm going to uh, plug for the TWIV special, um, one COVID vaccine for them all. Um, sort of reminds me of a Tolkien thing with Paul Offit. Um, I think it is um, much better to give Paul Offit a chance to explain his views and and for people to listen to this than just to rely on articles where there's a couple piecemeal quotes and you're trying to figure out how much of that was Paul Offit and how much of that was the uh, the science reporter. Um, several people, including John Muscola, sent me this uh, next preprint. Um, yes, speaking of preprints. Prior vaccination enhances immune responses during SARS-CoV-2 breakthrough infection with early activation of memory T cells, followed by production of potent neutralizing antibodies posted as a preprint. Um, and that's it. That's that's it's all in the title. Um, <laughs> my uh, my thought is that we are actually much more interested, as we talked about before, in how a vaccine prepares us for infection rather than the next vaccination. So in this investigation, the authors share data that show heightened spike-specific responses during infection of vaccinated compared to unvaccinated individuals, um, spike-specific CD4 T cells, plasma blasts expanded, and CD8 T cells were robustly activated during the first week. Um, in contrast, memory B cell activation neutralizing antibody production, and primary responses to non-spike antigens occurred during the second week. Um, as the authors say, these data demonstrate the functionality of vaccine-primed immune memory and highlight memory T cells as rapid responders during SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, this, there, this is an incredibly dense 40-plus uh, pages. Um, I've spent lots of time. I think I'm, I think I'm losing my, my vision because there's, there's so much packed in these um, figures. I, I feel like I need to put them on a big screen and sort of walk through each panel. Um, but figure six is, is really great for pulling it all together. Um, figure six, uh, rapid memory T cell activation and preexisting antibodies represent the early systemic um, adaptive immune responses during SARS-CoV-2 breakthrough infection. And it's really nice. What they've got is, is all the different responses in different colors, um, you know, days post-symptom onset. You can see this really rapid, um, you know, spike positive CD4 cells, spike positive CD8 cell activation. You really see the time course of the response. So be beautiful paper, by the way. Preprint. Yeah, beautiful preprint. <laughs> so there's a 3.3% chance this is all just nonsense. But <laughs> I don't think so. All right. Uh, well, now I will go to a paper that reminds me of the the early days, right? We didn't have we didn't have a COVID vaccine, so let's just give them a tuberculosis vaccine. Um, the article uh, Bacillus <laughs> Calmet. We're in, so BCG vaccine for prevention of COVID-19 and other respiratory tract infection in older adults with comorbidities, a randomized control trial published in CMI. And very simply, in this trial that looked at over 6,000 participants, BCG vaccination did not protect older adults with comorbidities against COVID-19, COVID-19 hospitalization, or clinically relevant respiratory tract infections. Okay, I did want to mention the article um, about a rare, but it looks like there may be an association here, um, incidence of chronic spontaneous urticaria following receipt of the COVID-19 vaccine booster in Switzerland published in JAMA Network Open. So these are the results of an investigation in Switzerland uh, looking at whether an association exists between COVID-19 vaccines and new onset chronic spontaneous urticaria. Um, so I love, I love the methods section. 
Uh, I'll, I'll read, 16 local allergists helped identify eligible patients who were then contacted through the Lausanne University Hospital. Patients were sent an online questionnaire link between April 14th and August 8th, 2022. Um, and then using this data, the investigators calculated the crude incidence risk ratio of this chronic spontaneous um, urticaria per 100,000 persons having received a first booster dose and estimated um, the relative risk um, after Moderna versus after Pfizer. Um, the median time between vaccination and onset um, was about 8 to 12 days in one of the cohorts, about 9 to 13 in the second cohort. Um, most of the time, actually, this was associated with the Moderna vaccine. Um, they estimated an overall crude incidence rate uh, per 100,000 persons with a booster at um, 24 and 19 in the two cohorts. Um, and actually suggesting this was, you know, 20 to 16 uh, fold higher after Moderna than it was with the um, with the Pfizer. So um, just uh, I'll share a case this week. And you know, we, we have seen a few of, of these folks with this, you, know, you, you vaccinate billions of people and you're going to see stuff. Um, and this was a this was a gentleman in his 30s, had a number of risk factors, went ahead, got his Pfizer shot, uh, developed urticaria, you know, probably you know, might have been more likely with Moderna, but this happened. Um, but he was very interested in getting protection, right, because he was high risk. Um, his urticaria is something that we're, we're, you know, it is occasionally he has what we call dermatographia, where he scratches himself and you could see the lines. Um, you know, well controlled with antihistamine, so not a severe case. Um, went ahead, got the J&J &J vaccine, tolerated that well. Um, just January, got the Novavax vaccine, tolerated that well with any and without any issues. So, the article, Relationship Between Immune Response to SARS-CoV-2 Vaccines and Development of Breakthrough Infection in Solid Organ Transplant Recipients, the Contrast Cohort, um, published in CID. Um, I took this really as a suggestion that if a patient failed to show a robust um, immune, you know, robust antibody response to vaccine, that correlate with a higher risk of a bad outcome. So I'm not sure we're seeing correlates of immunity here. We're just seeing a group that doesn't always respond well. Um, and this sort of goes along with the line. If you're not seeing much after a third shot, maybe we do a fourth shot trying to get those antibodies elevated. And it does seem to sort of add to that, that getting those antibodies elevated or not are associated with differential risks on a sort of a group population level. Um, good or bad news, depending on how you look on this, but um, an update in the MMWR, uh, COVID-19 Mortality and Progress Toward Vaccinating Older Adults, WHO Worldwide 2020 through 2022. Um, and here they're actually estimating the percent coverage with a completed COVID-19 vaccination series uh, for the overall population and for older adults um, from the uh, reporting countries through the WHO Electronic Joint Reporting Form. Um, and they're estimating this at about 76% with it being lower in middle income, in lower middle income countries. So they're reporting a low of 21% in the low income countries, about 50 to 51% in the upper, upper middle income, lower middle income, um, and then 74% in high income countries. Um, you know, really sort of unfortunately corresponding with, with areas where we were seeing a ratio of excess COVID-19 mortality. All right. Moving on, we've got some new stuff here, some interesting stuff in the COVID early viral upper respiratory non-hypoxic phase, right? So this is, you, you've, you've done everything you could, but now you have tested positive, um, starting to feel, you know, got some symptoms. You've actually got the disease, not just positive PCR test. So I will start this section with the article, Early Treatment with Pegylated Interferon Lambda for COVID-19, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, now, these results have been out there for a while, by the way, um, speaking of preprints and such, but these are the results of the TOGETHER trial, a randomized controlled adaptive platform trial involving predominantly vaccinated adults with severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, so SARS-CoV-2 infection in Brazil and Canada. Um, outpatients who presented with an acute clinical condition consistent with COVID-19 within seven days after the onset of symptoms received either this pegylated interferon lambda. It's actually kind of neat. There are these pre-filled um, single subcutaneous injections, 0 0.4 milliliters containing 180 micrograms or placebo. 
Um, the primary composite outcome was hospitalization or transfer to a tertiary hospital or an emergency department visit, um, observation greater than six hours, so a, a real visit due to COVID-19 within 28 days after randomization. So a total of 933 patients were assigned to receive the pegylated interferon lambda, and of note it's lambda, not just any interferon, and 1,018 were assigned to receive placebo. Um, overall, I think this is important, 83% of the patients had been vaccinated. Um, 2.7% in the interferon group had a primary outcome event as compared with 5.6% in the placebo group, a reduction in progression of 51%. Um, incidence of adverse events was similar in the two groups, not really getting an adverse event signal. Um, among patients who uh, received the interferon within three days after symptom onset, uh, this reduction was actually 65%. Um, a couple things to comment for us here in the U.S. This trial was done in Brazil and Canada um, and was initiated and run by academic researchers rather than the company itself. So uh, for this to pass the FDA, a large trial with enrollment in the U.S. would likely be required. Um, I mean, what I, what I like here, I actually find this an interesting approach, is this is really uh, just turning on the body's broad antiviral response. So this could be a, a general, you know, antiviral boost um, that looks in the study to be effective and safe. So it's sort of like echinacea that actually works. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments there, Vincent? So, Daniel, is a single injection, right? So does that get around the side effects of interferon that we see with hep C patients in the old days when we would treat them for long periods of time? Yeah, so that's that's what I was sort of looking here for, right, is, you know, if you get this shot, because, right, if, if when we used to treat um, patients for hepatitis C with these interferon-containing regimens, you feel like you have the flu for eight weeks. And mm -hmm. a lot of people would, after a while, yeah, I mean, it's miserable, it really was miserable. Um, it's interesting because here it's sort of, I guess it gets into the mix. You, you, you've got a viral syndrome. You feel like you've got a viral syndrome. You can't necessarily tell whether you got the interferon or not as far as, you know, adverse events. But it is helping boost, uh, you know, your immune system to properly target the virus, it seems. Um, and I also like the fact that it's just a single shot. But um, but really, the 51 to 65 percent reduction in hospitalization, right, it's not great. Okay. You know, it's not as good as, you know, as, you know, well, it, it's interesting. I was going to say it's not as good as 88, 89 percent that we saw in the Epic HR, right, for the yeah. Paxlovid in the unvaccinated. Um, it, it probably is not quite as good as we're getting with Paxlovid in the vaccinated. And that was sort of their, their I guess, part of the discussion here was these are vaccinated individuals. So they've had the, already had that 90 percent reduction. And now this is another, you know, 65 percent mm -hmm. reduction on top of that. And. I don't really see why you couldn't use this with Paxlovid, right? Boost the immune response and treat sure. with an antiviral. So thinking particularly of our, um, you know, our elderly folks, elderly, elderly folks, our people immunocompromised, et cetera. You know, we got letters from people who they don't like elderly, elderly, but we didn't, <laughs> we didn't make it up. That was Rachel Walensky, right? I wonder who actually, it's interesting, you know, elderly is different in different countries. Um, I, I had a partner who came from the UK and they use elderly um, at a different, different, you know, so you, you may need to move to the country that, you know, considers elderly, <laughs> you know, some older age. All right, Paxlovid. Um, now, I think this is important. This is sort of our, um, you know, informing. Last week, we mentioned about the updated EUA for Paxlovid, even mused a bit how it might be interpreted. Um, and I just want to comment that EUA was updated to remove the requirement for a positive viral test, um, but remains as follows. This is really important. Um, because, boy, I got a lot of calls this week. The U.S. FDA has issued an EUA for the emergency use of the approved product Paxlovid for the treatment of adults and pediatric patients 12 years of age and older with a current diagnosis of mild to moderate COVID who are at high risk of progression. So e e this really didn't say, oh, just start giving it to people to keep around. It just said, you know, like, let's take this scenario. I like this scenario where the husband has COVID. It's confirmed. Now it's five days later. The wife's coughing, has a fever, doesn't feel well, tells you she doesn't have any of those rapid tests around. You make the clinical diagnosis of COVID. You could put this person on Paxlovid. Um, 
previous to this, you were really supposed to say, we got to document this. We got to get a positive antigen. We've got to get a PCR. And I can only start once I get that. So does it really say just give out Paxlovid to anyone who wants it because they should, you know, maybe need it in the future. Uh, but you're allowed to make that clinical diagnosis without having to confirm it. Two, remdesivir for those that can get it. Um, and then, you know, I like to say last, um, last and least, uh, malnupiravir. Um, when we get to that second week, right, this is a biphasic disease, uh, the early inflammatory re lower respiratory hypoxic phase, um, you know, this is when our options um, have really diminished. Um, I, I do that analogy of, you know, if, if you don't treat during that fee first week, if you wait and see, this is like waiting to see um, in a patient with hypertension and then starting the medicine after the stroke, let's not start treatment after they have progressed to the early inflammatory phase. Um, we can do a little bit with steroids at the right time in the right patients, anticoagulation, pulmonary support, maybe remdesivir if early enough, um, maybe some immune modulation with tocilizumab. Moving to the late phase, past long COVID. We're going to wrap it up here and go to questions. But um, I just want to say this is still very much in the preliminary stage, um, but I thought this was interesting. So I wanted to discuss the article, long-term high-dose immunoglobulin successfully treats long COVID patients with pulmonary, neurologic, and cardiologic symptoms uh, published in Frontiers in Immunology. So this is a case series I want to point out. It's not a randomized control trial. Um, here, the authors describe nine patients suffering from long COVID um, for a range of, you know, it could be 101 out to 547 days. Um, ultimately, six were treated with high-dose IVIG, uh, 0 0.5 grams per kilogram IVIG every two weeks for a three-month trial. Um, and if clinical benefit was observed at that time, they would continue. Um, I do want to point out this was not without risk. Um, even in this small group of six people, um, one patient required a port, which became infected with Mycobacterium fortuitum. Uh, the port was removed. She was admitted to the hospital with an enlarging wound and fever, required IV antibiotics, oral levofloxacin for an additional eight weeks. Um, but they did report improvement, um, and perhaps this is enough preliminary evidence to warrant an RCT. So, Daniel, this is just... IVIG, it's not necessarily have COVID, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in it, right? Yeah, it's, so it's just IVIG. And, and the, the idea here um, is that, you know, one of the potential causes of long COVID are um, a number of auto antibodies, a number of antibodies that are being generated. Maybe they're triggering vasculitis or joint inflammation or cognitive impairment. And the idea with IVIG is you're basically going to target um, those, those antibodies, really the FC portion, um, you know, sort of a plasmapheresis uh, type right. approach. So interesting stuff. And I will say no one is safe until everyone is safe. I think we demonstrated here we are three years into pandemic and a lot of these low income countries, um, we have not done well with vaccines. Um, yeah, I know folks here in some of the um, high income countries are done with the pandemic, but um, a lot of these folks have not even had access to um, their vaccines. So no one is safe until everyone is safe. So now's a good time to pause, go to parasiteswithoutborders.com, click on that donate button. Um, thank you for everyone. We, we reached our goal for the Microbe TV fundraiser there, Vincent. So uh, thank you to all our listeners. Um, and we are now in the middle of our ASTMNH fundraiser. So February, March, and April, donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled up to a potential maximum donation of $30,000 from PWB to um, ASTMNH. Time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Justin writes, in episode 978, you answered the question about stopping other medications as you start Paxlovid. Seems like a better question is when to restart medications that may interact with Paxlovid, as Paxlovid inhibits metabolism of multiple other medications. How long does the effect last? In other words, if a medication is restarted for a patient before the Paxlovid has cleared from their system, could it cause a rise to toxic levels? Yeah, so it's really interesting because the the record. Yeah, so this is a great question. This is an important question, and we talked about. So let's say you're taking Lipitor or Torvastatin, um, and then you find out you have COVID. You start the Paxlovid, and so saying you you stop that statin, don't take any more. 
you finish your Paxlovid, the current recommendation is add five more days. So you're going to be stopping that Lipitor for a total of 10 days. Um, it's a little interesting. Why 10? Why not 9? Why not 11? It probably has to do with the number of these things on my hands. Um, but yeah, the, the current recommendation is for the five days while you're on the medicine and another five days afterwards. Um, and then physicians, pharmacists, um, you could sort of think about the potential interactions and use some judgment. But that's the current recommendation. You Paxlovid is five days, another five days, and then you restart those medicines that you stopped. Kimono writes, hope hoping you can chime in on guidance about COVID-positive elderly patients with underlying COPD and baseline oxygen sats 90 to 94% presenting with relative hypoxia. We see a fair share of these patients in our ED providers will often give an initial dose of IV solumidrol 60 to 125 mg as if treating a COPD exasperation, exacerbation despite current guidelines advising lower doses. As you recently reviewed studies using higher dose corticosteroids and COVID illness had worse outcomes than the standard dosing of DEX, six milligrams daily. First, it's not always clear what phase of COVID illness they're in, early viral versus later inflammatory, based on their vague history telling symptoms of maybe just feeling a bit weak for a while and or lack of home testing. But assuming that you have committed to using some steroid due to their COPD, should we be trying to keep this within the DEXA 6 mg dosing range, which my calculations would be prednisone 35 to 40 mg max? I feel like recent COPD guidelines have supported lower prednisone dosing regardless. Why don't you take that one first, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there's a lot here. So for our listeners, solumedrol um, is, is often when a patient comes in, they've got chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, maybe they uh, were a smoker or some other um, damage to their lungs. A lot of times they'll present to the emergency room, they'll be wheezing, they'll be having trouble getting you know, air in and out. Um, and a couple of the knee-jerk things that'll happen in, in an emergency room, um, one is these 125 milligram um, ampules, vials of solumedrol will get pushed in. Um, they might get a nebulizer as well. Um, the challenge here, right, is, is what can trigger these exacerbations in someone with COPD? Viruses, right? Actually, probably quite common. Um, and when someone is coming in um, with that being triggered by, by COVID, um, you, all the right points were brought up here. Um, we have found that there is a sweet spot when it comes to the dosing of the steroids. So six milligrams dexamethasone, that's about 35, 40 milligrams of prednisone. You're right on with this. 125 milligrams of solumedrol, that, that may not actually be the right dose for someone with a COPD exacerbation. As I mentioned, that may actually be excessive um, as we've learned more. Um, the other you brought, which is really critical, is are we in that first week or are we in that second week, right? If you're in that mm. first week, um, you actually can do harm, right? You're, you know, why bother to vaccinate someone if you're going to shut down their immune system when they're trying to fight off the virus? Um, so trying to avoid steroids if possible. But this is just the reality. This is this is an art. This is not a science. We don't have any great rapid tests that's going to tell you, ooh, we're on day four. Um, you get that history. We say the history is the most important but the least reliable. So if you're in that first week, um, if at all possible, do you really need those steroids? Are they really tight? Are they really wheezing? Um, can you treat that just with bronchodilators and nebulizers? Once you get into that second week, the sweet spot for the steroids is that about six milligrams a day of dexamethasone, that 35, 40 milligrams a day of prednisone. Um, so yeah, I think you're bringing up a lot of really good points here. Uh, hopefully a bunch of ER docs are listening and we'll start thinking a little bit more about these decisions. Second, I do worry that we are also doing harm by even giving corticosteroids, especially if the patient is likely in the early viral phase, despite studying antivirals, I fear that very few providers dare avoid the steroids altogether due to the COPD history. I'm not sure what my question really is, but I appreciate any commentary you can give to this conundrum. Yeah, no, it, it is it is a challenge, right? And I, and I think that's my advice. Start with the nebulizer. Start to see if you can get them breathing better. See if you really need those steroids when you're not sure where you are. Um, the other is going to be a change in that oxygen level, right? I mean, some some folks will come in and they're chronically on two or three liters mm -hmm. of oxygen. Now, if that then bumps up to four or five, um, okay, then you're going to say maybe I am getting into that that second week. But you may want to start with the nebulizer first. Try to sort this out. But no, this is this is a challenge. This is why we go 
to medical school. This is why you should you know, take a deep breath and think about um, and not just be following an algorithm, but trying to pick what's the best for that individual patient. And uh, finally, a commentary about remdesivir IV treatment for those patients for whom Paxlovid may not be appropriate. I work at a small critical access hospital and have the benefit of reviewing some of the cost analysis of medications and reimbursements. Both Medicare and Medicaid and many commercial insurances reimburse less than what our purchasing price is now that remdesivir is no longer provided by the government, state, under EUA, et cetera. Likewise for tocilizumab, which is ridiculously expensive, and we have therefore chosen not to bring on board. In the end, our mission is to do what is best for the patient, but there are yet more reasons why rural healthcare institutions are struggling to stay alive. Yeah, no, this, this is tough. You know, my wife and I were talking about this a little bit earlier about we, we have so many challenges in our country with regard to health care, um, things like this. I mean, I remember in Colorado when uh, I was talking to John Bender, actually one of the other docs in town, about how um, some of the vaccines, like physicians were losing money on vaccines, and, and he was able to set up some system where the state would actually provide the vaccines because vaccines were a, a, a loser for some of these, um, financially um, loser for some of these uh, family practice and pediatric populations. Um, so this is a huge challenge um, when the, the medicine that could make a difference is actually something that, you know, your organization is going to lose money trying to provide. I mean, a lot of these rural hospitals are struggling financially. Um, and the other is actually a lot of these areas. I think we've talked about 80 percent of counties in the United States don't have a single infectious disease doctor. Um, and so for the last few years, um, a number of us have been reaching out, trying to be helpful, crossing state lines with telemedicine. But mm -hmm. when the public health emergency ends, what happens? These, these counties no longer have the ability um, for us to reach out. And, and I will point out, uh, infectious disease doctors, we're not raking it in. This isn't a huge cost. Um, <laughs> but it is, it is great for people to actually have um, access to someone who's expert in the area. So um, a lot of challenges. Maybe this is a time to be writing letters to those uh, congressmen, congresswomen, um, you know, we, we need to make some changes. Uh, healthcare is, is, is here to hopefully help us be healthier, um, help us do a better job with public and individual health. All right. Lori writes three, three questions. First, I work in a pediatric office in San Francisco. We're considering moving from the Abbott ID now to the Safayet Expert Express so we don't need to stick so many swabs up the little one's noses. One concern I have is that the Safed literature states it has 100% PPA and 100% NPV. Is that possible? Seems suspect. <laughs> if we just want to do COVID testing, can we trust the ID now in this current viral environment? The studies I've seen seem already out of date by the time they're published. Any advice? Yeah, uh, you know, nothing is nothing is 100%, um, not even taxes, right? Um, I think Al Capone taught us that, only death. Um, you know, I, I think both are great approaches. Um, the Cepheid is really nice. I don't know um, how many people are familiar with this. So the Cepheid has these little cartridges and you pop them in and then you get your result. Uh, it's something we originally were using for tuberculosis. Um, the Abbott ID now is also, I think, uh, a very, very sensitive um, and very good um, system. So um, again, this is going to be one of those operational challenges where you, you look um, at the options um, and try to figure out what's best for you. But I think either either one is, is a fine option for making the diagnosis. All right. Second, in regards to the question in last week about the perceived punishment for COVID testing, for the little ones who are positive in their parents, it's especially punitive. They can't wear a well-fitting mask, so they're home for 10 days. I'm not sure even a 12-year-old can wear a well-fitting mask, especially at lunchtime. And if there are multiple little kids in the same house and there's ongoing exposure, the parents may have to stay home for 20 days or more. This seems like this should change. Any advice or comments on this? Yeah. So this is obviously a hot button issue, right? I, I People can probably guess, right? So, you, you know, you've got a situation like this on one side and then the other people on the other side who are immunocompromised, um, you know, who should they get COVID or at high risk of a bad outcome? And, and they're really saying, oh, my gosh, really, um, is it so inconvenient for your child to miss this educational opportunity? I may die. Yeah, this is really tough. And this is where, you know, public health and politics and all kinds of things meet. So um, I'm sort of glad I'm not going to be the one who has to make this decision. Um, but I, I do understand um, in our culture, um, the current 
advice where you end up um, staying, you know, missing 10, 20 days of work to take care of your children, um, not something that in our culture is, is necessarily going to continue. And the third is a request. I'm neither a PhD nor a surgeon. I'm a busy <laughs> pediatrician. I listen to these podcasts while driving with a dozen things in my head, and I would love to see figures, but that would be dangerous. Sometimes I blink and I miss something important. Would you mind giving us the 10-second take-home point at the end of each sub-segment? <laughs> okay. That seems like a good idea. I mean, I, I certainly don't want you to blank, look down, and then, you know, miss the fact that that car in front of you has stopped. Um, so, yeah, I'll, you know, I, I said it's pretty reasonable. We'll just do like a quick, um, we'll throw a quick 10, 15 second recap. Um, but I, I will say, listen to the whole episode because the, the purpose here is not for us just to give you the soundbite, but to try to go into the science to, to show you, you know, why we're suggesting certain things. You know, I, I never want um, the clinical update to be, you know, my opinions. I want them to be me sharing the science so that everyone can, can make informed decisions. And one quick one from Evan. It's been reported that either a severe or mild case of COVID can lower IQ. Has this been substantiated? Is there an additive diminishment with repeated infection? Does the re patient recover IQ? Um, you know, there are a certain percent of individuals that actually have cognitive impairment, and this can be ongoing. Um, you know, and so if, if you include them in the mix, then I'm going to say yes. Um, but then becomes really a separate question. What about those folks that, that had a mild case that didn't develop um, long COVID, which unfortunately is millions of folks here in the U.S. alone? Um, what about the rest of folks? Do they really lose a couple IQ points? I'm not sure about that. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe.